yesterday, ladies, when everything was going wrong and the children were fighting, and how many of you were counting your blessings? It's only after we stop and think and realize what all we have that we can count our blessings often, and it should be the other way around. We should be counting our blessings all the time, but we are human. Thank you, Terrell, for that opening, because if we look at the, we could look at different of the mothers in the Bible, and I, as Terrell was sharing that, I just was trying to contemplate a little bit. I don't think there's any of the mothers that we often use, Mary, um, Ruth, different of the mothers, Hannah I'm going to use this morning. They all had problems. They all struggled. They all went through things that they could have said, hey, I give up. I quit. But they didn't. They went on. And I trust that uh, You can take encouragement of that. You may be here this morning and you're not a mother. My message is to mothers, but at the same time, it includes all of us, from the youngest to the oldest. And that's what I want to share this morning in the aspect. Sometimes I think there's those here that think that, well, it's Mother's Day, I won't go, I'm not a mother, or whatever. No, please come and participate and share and realize that there's also something for each one of you, whether we're male or female. And by the way, are you mothers this morning according to the world? Yesterday, and I wrote the headlines down, I don't want to get political, but I thought it was interesting that this came up just before Mother's Day. House Democrats replace women with birthing people. Reproduction is for every body. So are you mothers? <laughs> or are you birthing people? We all are, according to that. Birthing people. It's, it's just unreal, brothers and sisters, that the things that we are seeing and how fast it's going. Our lesson, our Sunday school lesson this morning talked about that that They did not have spiritual understanding. If there ever was a time that there's no spiritual understanding within the world, it's today. And I'm I'm guessing it's going to get worse. That's not my message this morning, but anyway. I'd like to ask you this morning, how many of you are wise investors? How Many of you are wise investors. I could ask how many of you are investors. Would you immediately think of the stock market, mutual funds, and there may be many here who are doing that. Do you check everything out before you invest? Do you go through all the details and make sure that what you're doing is going to come out good in the end? Well, as we go through this this morning, maybe you'll see whether you are a wise investor or not. But there's been a lot of focus recently on the stock market. In fact, there's trillions of dollars that are are in the stock market and much more than what I can comprehend anyway. And uh, the people who put their money in the stock market place their money there to, and do so with the hope and the intention that their stocks will do well and that they will make a profit. But of course, it doesn't always turn out that way. Sometimes stocks don't do well, and the investor loses some or maybe even all of his money. Now, I'm not talking about the stock market this morning, but I think you'll see the similarities that There are those who are so involved in those types of things that we don't realize what else is going on around. And I trust that's none of us this morning. There's other things that we need to be invested in, and that's what I really want to look at. No, you may not have money invested. However, while you don't have uh, a monetary investment in stocks, you are still an active investor 
in many areas of your life. Every action, every attitude, every activity is an investment in something and it will reap dividends. It will reap dividends either to the glory of God or to the glory of the flesh. Now, again, in the stock market, a wise investor, like I said, he'll study the stocks before he invests so that he can maximize his return. And those who make a wise investment of their lives do the same thing. Are you making a wise investment with your life? People who are wise investors of life examine all the various areas of their life so that they are sure that they will receive the greatest dividend from their investment, or I trust that's what we're doing. Turn with me to 1 Samuel. I want to look at the account of Hannah. And there's, I guess I'll read the whole chapter. Verses 1 through 28. 1 Samuel 1. Now there was a certain man of Ramoth and Zophim of Mount Ephraim, and his name was El- Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tuhu, and the son of Zuf, an Ephraimite. Now Elkanah was a Levite. Just kind of interesting to notice that he was a Levite. Verse 2, he had two, two wives. The name of one was Hannah. The name of the other was Paniah. And Paniah had children, but Hannah had no children. And this man went up out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And when the time was that Elkanah Offered, he gave to Paniah his wife and to all his sons and her daughters portions. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah. But the Lord had shut up her womb. And her adversary also provoked her sore, for to make her fret, because the Lord had shut up her womb. And as he did so year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her. Therefore she wept and did not eat. Then said Elkanah, her husband, to her, Hannah, why weepest thou? And why eatest thou not? And why is thy heart grieved? Am I not better to thee than ten sons? So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat upon a seat by the post of the temple of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of, the, of thine handmaid and remember me and not forget thine handmaid, but will give unto thine handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. And it came to pass, as she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli marked her mouth. Now Hannah, she spake in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought that she had been drunken. And Eli said unto her, How long wilt thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. And Hannah answered and said, No, my lord, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Count not thine handmaid for a daughter of Belial, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. And she said, Let thine handmaid find grace in thy sight. So the woman went her way and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. I think, ladies, you ought to underline that last comment there. She was so sad, she was so bitter maybe and everything else but she walked away from here and it says and her countenance was no more sad and they rose up in the morning early and worshiped before the Lord and returned and came to their house in Ramah and Elkanah knew Hannah his wife and the Lord remembered her wherefore it came to pass when the time was come about 
after Hannah had conceived that she bare a son and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of the Lord. And the man Elkanah and all his wife went up to offer unto the Lord the yearly sacrifice and his vow. But Hannah went not up, for she said unto her husband, I will not go up until the child be weaned, and then I will bring him, that he may appear before the Lord, and there abide forever. And Elkanah her husband said unto her, Do what seemeth thee good. Tarry until thou have weaned him. Only the Lord established his words, so the woman abode and gave her son suck until she weaned him. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her, with three bullocks, and one ephra of flour, and a bottle of wine, and brought him unto the house of the Lord in Shiloh, and the child was young. And they slew a bullock, and brought the child to Eli. And she said, O my Lord, as thy soul liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee here praying unto the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord hath given me my petition, which I ask of him. Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he should be lent to the Lord, and he worship the Lord there. The he there is Samuel. Samuel was just weaned. How old was Samuel? Probably around five. Different commentators say it was either between three and five. All the three to five-year-old children stand up. Can't see you, you're too short. <laughs> but just look. That's the size, the age of the child that she left at the temple. And it says, and he worshipped the Lord there. Parents, have we done our jobs? Are we doing our jobs? If I can put it that, I should, should say responsibility. It's not a job. It's a responsibility that we have. But this passage here presents to us a woman by the name of Hannah. She made some very wise investments that, she, that continue to reap dividends even today. Look, we're talking about her today. We're talking about her son. The dividends are still being there to be utilized. Let's notice here where she had made wise investments, and I want to encourage us to make at least some of the same investments and probably others that we have before us in life that this, this woman of faith made. She had a tremendous faith, I believe, because like I said, after she walked away from Eli and Eli had told her to go, and the Lord grant her her petition. She walked away with gladness. I believe she had faith. First of all, she made a wise investment in the family. Now, Hannah invested her life in her family in spite of all the difficult circumstances. They weren't pleasant. They weren't pleasant at all in this home, I don't believe. Right away we learned that Hannah was married to a man who had two wives, and right there was a lot of the problems. I still don't know, understand how Solomon, with the thousand that he had, that we didn't see more problems. But this is a recipe for disaster. And yet Hannah was not looking for an exit here. She wasn't looking for a way out. She stayed in the family, and she worked to make the best of a bad situation. Now again, we're talking about Hannah and we, we could think mothers, but I think this applies to any of us, whether we're children, whether we're teenagers, whether we're fathers, whoever we are. We could all be in families where there are bad situations. Are we looking for a way out or are we looking for a way to help it? I think that applies to all of us. You know, God never said the family would be an easy place to live. Families are great and they are wonderful. But every one of them has people in it. And where you have people, the potential for problems is there. The potential for problems is there in every one of them. There will be disagreements and there will be trouble. But the secret of that all is not running away, not looking for an exit 
not trying to get out of it, but trying to help. And even that can be difficult. Learn to make an investment in your family, regardless of the difficulties that you may face in life or how difficult it may be. You're there, let make an investment in it. You know, God's people need to learn to the truth that marriage and family is a lifetime investment or commitment. Might be a better word. It doesn't, it, it doesn't just happen for a little time, but it's something that goes on for, the, for our, our life or lives that may be involved. Her husband here, his other wife, had children, but Hannah was barren. Now, Peniah used Hannah's barrenness to make her life miserable. It seemed to me that I detect a hint of jealousy in this home. Verse 5 tells us that Elkanah loved Hannah. Where does that put Peniah? Peniah has children, but my husband loves the other one better than me. So you have a problem immediately. She used that leverage in the household to mock Hannah. It reminds me a little bit of the story we could go to Rachel and Leah and the two handmaids that they had. And Jacob had four, of, four wives, so to speak. But you see a lot of similarities. But anyway, she used it to mock Hannah. And all of this criticism and the belittling of her life made it almost impossible for Hannah, I believe, or it would have been quite uncomfortable. Yet she continued to invest in that family. And we had, she had a tremendous testimony by doing so. Now, families are like that sometimes, and I'm referring to the discouragement that comes from time to time in a home. Husbands, Wives, children, anyone can feel that they are unappreciated, that they are taken for granted, that they may be the target of criticism. Sometimes we get discouraged at our fellow family members by what they say and what they do. But discouragement is no reason to close the door on the family. No, you continue to invest your life in the people that you love, knowing that in time you will reap a harvest for the glory of God if you really are sincere. Keep investing. You may never see the results that you want, but there is a biblical principle that speaks to your need today, and Terrell already referred to that. You know, we may pass off the scene before we see the answer to our prayers, but our prayers may still be answered. Galatians 6, verses 7 through 9 read like this, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Verse 9, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. We have a promise. We have a promise, and we can claim that promise. You know, when we sow the right things, we will reap the right harvest. So we need to keep investing in people's lives and leave the harvest in God's hands. Remember, he is the I am. He will never fail. Now, it may appear that the investments that you make in a family are not paying off at the present time. It may look like your spouse and your children are not all that you planned or that you prayed, or that the, you hoped that they would be. If that's the case, let me encourage you this morning to keep on investing. Keep on investing. Life, where there's life, there's hope. 
And so we keep on keeping on. Your family is too important for you to stop investing yourself in them now. It may seem to you like all the giving and the receiving and, and none of it is getting you. You're not getting anything out of it. But for those who make wise investments in their family, there's dividends that can come at very unexpected times and in marvelous ways. And every one of you could probably speak to that. Yes, there's been bad days. Maybe there's bad weeks and even bad months. But then there comes that ray of light. Something happens. Something is said. And it's just like, boy, it was, everything was worth it. And I trust that you find that this morning, that you find it all worth it. It appears like family was important to Hannah, but it also appears that faith was very important to her as well. She made a wise investment in her faith. I see a woman here who knows the Lord on a personal level. level. We see that by her prayer and her praise. She had a personal relationship with the God of Israel. And she was openly active in the practice of her faith. Do you know the greatest gift that you can give your family? Do you know the greatest gift that you can give your family? Someone have a thought? Pardon? Time? Pardon? Prayer. There's another one that I'm thinking of. Love? Pardon? Yourself? Someone, what? The knowledge of Christ? We're getting close. The greatest thing that I believe that you can give your family is the knowledge that they have the knowledge that you are saved. Isn't that a tremendous gift, parents, to know that your children are saved? The greatest single investment that you can make in life is that of investing in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Young people, that's the greatest gift you can give your parents. If you want to give something to Mother for Mother's Day, tell her that you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and that you're saved. And maybe you've already done that. Maybe they already know that. But it doesn't hurt to tell them again. Nothing in time or eternity is as important as your personal relationship with Christ. So be sure that you make that investment. Now Hannah was a woman who possessed a practical faith in God, I believe. She didn't just know about him. She knew him and she trusted him for all of her needs. She trusted him for the impossibles. And Terrell read that too. With God, all things are possible. I think it was Terrell that read that. Maybe it wasn't Sunday school. I'm not sure. But somebody read it this morning. She trusted him for the impossible in her life. She didn't just talk about the faith in God. She lived it. Parents, the best thing that you can do for your children is to live the faith that you profess. So she sets the standard here that each one of us should resolve to meet. Not only should we possess a testimony concerning our faith, but we must live it out, that testimony, every day, day by day, as we go through life. And nothing makes an investment in the lives of others around us like a genuine life lived for the glory of God. You know, if everyone does that, then there should be peace in every family. A practical faith 
is a proclaiming faith, and it always points others to Christ. So make an investment in a faith that you can live out day by day. Make an investment in a faith that you can live out. If you can't live out the faith that you profess, then we have a problem. We see that more than anything else here, Hannah wanted a child. She wanted to give that gift to her husband, and she wanted to experience the fulfillment of motherhood, and I believe that's true of every lady, every girl, every female, if I can put it that way. I think that's something that they want to fulfill that. And she asked God for a son. And she promised to give that son back to him for his glory. Now, Hannah had a depth of faith that we don't often see. And what a blessing it is when we come to the place as investors in the faith where we can believe God for the impossible the impossible situations in our lives and willingly give everything to him for his glory. This is the kind of faith that God is looking to develop in each one of us and the kind of faith that God can use for his glory. And I ask us the question, do we have it? Do I have it? Do you have it? That kind of faith. Well, we see that she made a wise investment in the family. She invested in spite of discouragement. She made in wise, a wise investment in, in faith, in the faith. Now I'd like to look at she made a wise investment in the future. And each one of us can do that also. She made an ultimate commitment, the ultimate commitment that a mother could make. She totally gave her child to the Lord. She held nothing back. She committed him to the Lord before he was even conceived. And I know that there's mothers here that prayed for their children before they were born. I have no doubt about that. But remember, she was barren. And before it was ever conceived, she had this prayer in the temple. And she dedicated him to the Lord when he was born. And she gave him to the Lord when he was weaned. She took him and gave him to the Lord. It was a once-for-all commitment from which she never looked back. It doesn't appear like it. She had, made a de- she had made a decision, and she went through with it. And she sowed a seed that would be reaped for generations. So she made an investment in the future. Imagine how hard it must have been to leave Samuel at the tabernacle. Remember now, you held up your three- to five-year-olds. You're leaving that child at the temple Imagine how much she must have anticipated those yearly trips that she went back and she gets to see him again in the temple. Once a year, she gets to see him. Mothers, would you enjoy that? Imagine her heartbreak each year that she left to go back home after seeing him for a day or two. I'm not sure how long they were at the temple. But imagine how good she felt as she watched him develop into a man of God. Chapter 2, verse 2 says, And the child Samuel grew on and was in favor both with the Lord and also with man. She was seeing her investment pay off. And it was quite an investment. It had been worth the sacrifice. Now this is the kind of commitment God is looking for in all of us. In all of us. He wants us to invest the totalness, everything of our lives on his altar. He wants us to give all that we have and are to him without holding back anything from him. He wants for a, a once-for-all commitment for his glory. Now, some of us may have children that need to be placed on the altar this morning. Was reminded again this morning downstairs that child dedication is coming up, and that's not necessarily what I'm saying here this morning. Yeah, we can bring our, and should bring our children to child dedication. But parents, we need to do that long before that time. How long has it been since we, with a broken heart, came before the Lord and cried out? 
for someone in the family, for the souls of our children. Maybe they are what they are today because of the inconsistencies that they witnessed in our lives, in your life, in my life. Maybe they're out there because they rejected the faith that we professed, and maybe it was only a profession. We didn't live it. You know, regardless of why they are there, they need parents and grandparents praying for them. To bring them to God's altar and to trust that God will touch them again, that they will reach their Heavenly Father. Now, I realize that all children, we all make a choice. And just because maybe one of our children are not where we would like to see them, doesn't mean that we are at fault because we all have a choice. But let's try to do our part the best that we can so at least we can say we've done our part or tried to. Well, Hannah presented her son Samuel here to the Lord and he by the grace of God became a mighty man of God. He set a standard of righteousness for the nation of Israel. He was a man greatly used by the Lord. He was a man that anointed Saul and David to be kings. He was a man that, who served as the spiritual leader of Israel for many years. I didn't really check how many. He was a man that he, he was because of the investment that his mother made in his life before he was born and during those early years. They learn so much, don't they? And so quickly. And because she made the kind of investment that she did, an entire nation was blessed for many years. In fact, I believe Hannah's investment in Samuel continues to reap dividends to this day. Any time that someone is helped, fed, challenged, or blessed, by just reading about her life like we are this morning. And Hannah's investment in Samuel continued to live long after she was dead. Yes. Those are the kinds of dividends that we should all want to reap. Are we making those kinds of investments so that we can reap those dividends? Now, some of you are making a good investment in the future today. You bring your children to Sunday school. You bring your children to church. You know, I had to think back, as long as I can remember as a young child, when Sunday morning came, we were, I mean, we just went to church. I mean, that was the accepted thing. I, w I didn't know anything different. It was only after I became older that I decided that I wasn't going to go to church like I had been taught. Are your children, do they know that Sunday morning we can't lay around and we can't do this and that because we, we're going to church? Do they know that? Some of you are doing that. Keep on doing it. Does that mean everything else is going to go okay? No. But do our part. Let's do our part. Sunday school, by the way, is a good place for children to start learning. So bring them to Sunday school, to church. When the church doors are open, try to be there. You bring them when it isn't easy, and it, you, sometimes it's not convenient. But you are instilling in them that the church, God's house, is an important place to be. And that's a thing that's almost a thing of the past for many families. Let's not be one of them. You're teaching that right and wrong do matter. You're teaching them about Jesus. You're teaching them the important lessons of life, or at least one of them. And they are learning the lessons from watching your faith. Dad, Mom, do we drag out of bed and say, oh, we got to go to church again today? That's what they see. We're teaching them right there. They are learning lessons from your faith. You may think they aren't seeing much from you. You may think that they aren't getting the message, but they are. 
And that if that is the case, you will reap that type of an investment too many times. So keep investing, remain faithful, and the Lord will bless your efforts in doing that. I have a question that I just came up to me this week as I was studying this because of something that happened the other day at our house. How old does a child have to be to learn or to understand or to remember something? How old does a child have to be? And how many of you could go back and probably remember, have you ever went back and tried to remember the first thing that you remember? How old were you? We think that, you know, children are young. They don't, they don't know, they don't understand, they don't learn. Well, I just had a, something happened the other week that kind of impressed me. And I see that my great-grandson is here this morning. But the other week, just a week or so, they were at our place. And I said something to Stetson. I said, let's go out on the porch. And he said, where are the bunnies? I said, what? I mean, this is a two-year-old. Well, every year I put two little porcelain bunnies or whatever they're made of. They're out there sitting by the eave trough on the front porch. And in the fall, I put them away. And here he was, the next spring now, saying, where are those bunnies? Now, don't tell me that a two-year-old can't remember, because he did. I say that to, to remind each one of you parents. You think they're not catching it. You think they're not understanding it. And they're too young for this, and they're too young for that. They know. They're catching it. They're catching it. So let's be careful. Yes, Hannah was a wise investor, are you? Ladies, your work is not in vain. The Bible tells us about four different rewards of a godly mother in Proverbs. Her children will praise her. Her husband will praise her. God will acknowledge her. And she will leave a legacy behind. You'll find that all in Proverbs 31. So it's not in vain. So I ask each of us this morning, and especially parents, can you trust God with your children? You can if you trust God with your life. Can you lead your children to serve the Lord? You can if you serve the Lord. Can you lead your children to worship God? You can if you worship God. Can you lead your children to become mighty men and women of God, individuals that he uses to advance his kingdom? You can if you have built your life upon the rock of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. We have a tremendous privilege and a tremendous responsibility. And whether you're young or old this morning, you're making investments. Are they investments for God? Lord bless you.